Hey guys, welcome back to Med School Moose. This is going to be Emergency Medicine Board Exam High Yield Facts Part 4. Hopefully you've had a chance to watch Parts 1 through 3. If not, I will put a link for that playlist up in the top right hand corner of this video right here. Same two disclaimers as always. This information is high yield for the in-training exam that emergency medicine residents take every year as well as for the ABEM qualifying exam required for board certification. If you are seeing information that is different from this video in the board resources that you are using, I would recommend using that just to be consistent with your studying. All that being said, let's go ahead and jump right into it. First one here, what microbes can cause a pseudo-appendicitis? We all know about appendicitis. We need to know the things that can cause a pseudo-appendicitis that can mimic that. There's two big ones you need to know. It's Yersinia enterocolitica and Campylobacter. Infections with these organisms can mimic appendicitis. Patients may present with right lower quadrant pain and some other GI symptoms, but you want to know that these are mimics of acute appendicitis. As you can see, went with a yellow and blue kind of Easter theme here, so let's keep going. Osborne waves on EKG are associated with blank. If you see Osborne waves, if you see that mentioned, you want to be thinking hypothermia. These Osborne waves are also known as J waves. They're a deflection right at the J point, and here's your visual stimulus right here. We can see an Osborne wave right here at the J point. Remember, this is a positive deflection of the J point that can be indicative of hypothermia, but is not pathognomonic for hypothermia. It is very important to know that. If you see this, you want to be thinking about hypothermia, but it is not pathognomonic, and this is called an Osborne wave. What medication and dosage is used to treat syphilis? We all probably know the medication, right? We know it's going to be some type of penicillin, but that's not enough. We want to know the dosage and how how it's administered. So in this case, it's going to be penicillin G benzathine, 2.4 million units IM. All right, that is how you treat syphilis. It is just one administration of this in the early stage, and later on, it may be weekly for three weeks in later stages of syphilis. If for some reason a patient has a severe allergy to penicillins, doxycycline can be used as an alternative, but really want to know exactly how much and how that penicillin G is administered. Varicella zoster immunoglobulin should be given within blank in pregnant women exposed to zoster who have negative titer. So if you have a pregnant patient that comes in, they were exposed to zoster, it's a confirmed exposure, but they have negative titers, in what time frame do you want to give them varicella zoster immunoglobulin? It's within 96 hours. Really important to know that time. What is the most common pathogen transmitted from a human bite? Super important to know this as well. It's going to be Echinella carotens. Moving on, what is the treatment of choice for Chagas disease? This is something that's a little bit more out there, right? We're not seeing this every day in emergency medicine, but they really like to ask about these obscure infectious diseases these questions. So the treatment of choice for Chagas disease is nifertamox. Okay, remember that Chagas disease is caused by Trypanosoma cruzi. It is spread by the kissing bug. The treatment is going to be nifertamox. If that is not available for some reason, you can use benzonidazole. That is a little bit lower yield. The big treatment to know for Chagas disease is nifertamox. Blank is the most common fatal encephalitis worldwide. Really important to know this. HSV1 it is the most common fatal encephalitis worldwide. What is the dosing for magnesium sulfate for eclampsia? This is another one of those questions. We all know the treatment for eclampsia. We know what the medication is. It's magnesium sulfate, but that's not enough. You have to take it to that second step. You need to know the dosing as well. Generally, the dosing is going to be four to six grams IV over 15 to 20 minutes, and then you start a drip at two grams per hour after that. This is not a hard and fast rule. Obviously, you want to be checking your patient's hemodynamics, how they're responding, if they're continuing to have seizure activity, but this is a general rule of thumb, four to six grams IV over 15 to 20 minutes, and then you start a drip at two grams per hour after that. Since you're giving these higher doses of magnesium sulfate, remember the signs of magnesium toxicity. You want to be on the lookout for decreased respiratory drive as well as loss of deep tendon reflexes. Moving on here, what medication, dosage, and duration are used to treat bacterial vaginosis? Guys, this is another one of those questions. The basic level of understanding is knowing the medication and how to treat the disease. You need to go further than that. You need to know dose Dosing, you need to know frequency, all of those things. So if we're treating bacterial vaginosis, it's going to be metronidazole, 500 milligrams PO, BID, two times a day for seven days. This is generally the treatment. Obviously, if a patient has allergy, there may be alternatives, but this is the big treatment that you want to know and that you've probably already used before if you diagnosed this in the ED. What is the mechanism of action of edrophonium? This is a medication that we don't see every day, probably something you may remember deep in your brain from USMLE Step 1 studying. The mechanism of action of edrophonium, it is an acetylcholine esterase inhibitor. Why is this important? Well, because it is an acetylcholine esterase inhibitor, it prevents the breakdown of acetylcholine and can allow for muscle control 
contraction and improvement of myasthenia gravis symptoms. It can be used to diagnose myasthenia gravis, but it can also be used to treat a myasthenic crisis. The other important thing you need to know, this is sometimes called the tensilin test. You may have seen that in your step one studying as well. The tensilin test, which is where you use this medication, if the patient's symptoms get better, that is diagnostic of myasthenia gravis. Bilateral facet dislocations are typically caused by what mechanism? You need to know the different mechanisms for all of these injuries to the spinal cord. In this case, it's going to be caused by hyperflexion. Sigmoid volvulus is treated with blank, whereas cecal volvulus is treated with blank. They have two different ways that they need to be managed, and you need to know both of them. So sigmoid volvulus is treated by sigmoidoscopy, whereas cecal volvulus is treated by laparotomy. Cecal volvulus can be a little bit harder to access. The sigmoid volvulus is a little bit further down in the colon. Cecal volvulus is a little bit more upstream. So to treat that, you need to do a laparotomy. ST elevations in leads V5 and V6 are concerning for occlusion of which coronary artery. This is super important. We need to know how different EKG changes in different leads can correspond to coronary arteries. In this case, ST elevations in leads V5 and V6 are concerning for occlusion of the left circumflex artery. What are the three most common causes of postmenopausal bleeding? Number one is going to be vaginal or endometrial atrophy that occurs in about 60% of patients. Number two is endometrial polyps, which is about 12% of patients. And then number three is endometrial cancer, which occurs in about 10% of patients. So if you see postmenopausal bleeding, yes, you absolutely want to be concerned about cancer, but just know that the most common cause technically atrophy. What are the indications for fasciotomy due to snake envenomation? This one is a little bit tricky. It's a little bit of a trap because there are no indications, right? If a patient has a snake envenomation, if they're bitten by a snake and they develop compartment syndrome, this specific type of compartment syndrome is is refractory to fasciotomy. All right, it's not an absolute. Obviously, if you speak to your surgeons and they say that they want to attempt it, that might be a little bit different. But for the most part, if you see this on the exam, a patient developing compartment syndrome due to a snake envenomation, usually they do not go through a fasciotomy because the symptoms will not get better. It is refractory. What is the first line treatment for bezoars? Remember, bezoars are this tightly packed collection of partially digested or undigested material, and the treatment for that is going to be chemical dissolution. The important thing to know Note here is that this does not work for trichobezoars, which usually contain hair. And to go along with that, what is the treatment for trichobezoars? It's actually going to be endoscopic removal. Unfortunately, chemical dissolution does not work, so you have to go in there via endoscopy and actually physically remove it. Next one here, what medication is an effective reversal agent for dabigatran? Some of us might know this by the, the trade name Praxbind, but of course Praxbind isn't going to be on the exam. So you need to know the more difficult name, the monoclonal antibody name, which is adarcizumab. I'm probably butchering that, but I do want you to see that word, see that name, because that is the actual name for the reversal agent for dabigatran. Moving on, what is the most important step in decontamination after radiation exposure? The number one thing that you want to do, the one thing you want to do immediately is removal of clothing, because that clothing contains radiation. It is irradiated. You want to get that off of the patient, get it away from everyone. Moving on, why is glucagon used as a reversal agent for beta blocker overdose? Hopefully, you've had a chance to see this in the department. Beta blocker overdose is a really, really interesting toxic ingestion. Uh, and the reason that we like to use glucagon, there's a couple different things. First of all, it has positive inotropic and chronotropic effects, which can help counteract the bradycardia and some of the hypotension that is caused by a beta blocker overdose. But the other important thing is that it directly counteracts beta blocker induced hypoglycemia. These patients who take too much beta blocker, they can be persistently hypoglycemic. Glucagon is a great medication to give to kind of help reverse that. Moving on, what are Burton's lines? This is a blue discoloration along the gum lines that is seen in chronic lead poisoning. And here's going to be a visual stimulus. As you can see here, there's a little bit of blue discoloration along the gum lines here. If they show you a picture, if they talk about a patient that's exhibiting some weird confusion, altered mental status, that kind of thing, then you want to be thinking Burton's lines and you want to be thinking chronic lead poisoning. Moving on, what is the leading cause of myocarditis worldwide? We already identified the leading cause of fatal encephalitis. The leading cause of myocarditis is Chagas disease. Remember this one, it comes back. Remember, Remember, Chagas disease is the condition that causes everything to kind of get bigger, so patients may have mega esophagus, cardiomegaly, those kinds of things, and it is the leading cause of myocarditis worldwide. What is another name for the bark scorpion? These exams love these obscure envenomations, these insects, these kinds of things. They're not going to tell you bark scorpion. They're going to tell you the scientific name and want you to identify it based on that. In this case, another name for the bark scorpion is centroroides. Remember that envenomation from these scorpions can cause pancreatitis as well as a non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema.
What is the most sensitive imaging modality for diagnosing diaphragmatic injury? This one's a little bit of a trick as well, because really there's no imaging modality. It's, it's laparoscopy. You have to actually go in there, take a look at it, and see that there's been diaphragmatic injury. Which types of mandibular fractures do not typically require prophylactic antibiotics? In this case, it's going to be a condylar fracture. These are the only types of mandibular fractures that are not considered open, and therefore they do not require prophylactic antibiotics. Really, little tip that you need to know there that's important. Moving on, which anatomic clavicle fracture is most likely to require surgical repair? So which part of the clavicle, if that's fractured, is most likely to require repair? It's going to be the medial third. And the reason being is because it's the most likely to cause neurovascular compromise. There's obviously a lot of important blood vessels and nerves that run in that area. So if you fracture the medial third of the clavicle, that is more than likely going to require surgical repair due to it being so high risk. Central cord syndrome is typically caused by what mechanism? This is going to be hyperextension injury. Remember, we already mentioned bilateral facet dislocations are typically caused by hyperflexion. Central cord syndrome is typically caused by hyperextension. You want to keep that right in your head. Getting close to the end here, what compound should be used in the treatment of hydrofluoric acid burns? Again, one of those things that we don't see in the department very much, but they really love to ask this on the exam. If a patient has hydrofluoric acid burns to the hand, for example, the treatment is going to be calcium gluconate. This can be provided topically, and if the symptoms aren't improving with that, it can be intravascular. It can be injected directly into the vein or into the artery. The reason that this is so effective is because calcium ions sequester fluoride ions, and they can help relieve some of the pain caused by that burn. What is Kier's sign? This is one of those eponyms that unfortunately we kind of just need to know. It is left shoulder pain in the setting of abdominal trauma, and this is classically associated with splenic rupture. So if you have a patient that comes in, MVC or some type of blunt abdominal trauma, and they're having a lot of left shoulder pain, you want to be thinking about potentially a splenic rupture. This is the last one here. What volume of blood is required to raise a patient's hemoglobin by one gram per deciliter? It's asking for a volume, and it's going to be about five milliliters per kilogram. So in a 70 kilogram patient, it ends up being somewhere about 350 milliliters. Remember, one unit of whole blood is about 500 milliliters, and one unit of packed red blood cells is about 350 milliliters. So either of those, that's why we give it as one unit it, and it should hopefully raise the patient's hemoglobin by about one gram per deciliter. That is the end of this video. As always, thank you so much for watching. Please give me a thumbs up. It'll help me out a lot. Please subscribe to my channel to get all the latest updates, new videos when I post them, as well as updates about other things that are going on. Thank you so much for watching. Good luck with your studying.